Project Gemini, rendezvous in space. Now from the CBS News Space Center in New York, Walter Cronkite. Well, this looks like a big day for the American space program, for the world space program for that matter. Gemini 6, after that perfect launch this morning, is closing with Gemini 7. Every maneuver has gone perfectly so far. They're less than 100 miles apart, 88 miles apart uh, in the last report just a moment ago as they began uh, whirling over northern Brazil. And their actual rendezvous maneuvers, the final closing maneuvers, will come in the next 25 minutes with the final closure about uh, an hour from now. But so far, everything's gone well. The radars uh, are locked on between the two spacecraft. They're facing each other with Gemini 6, about 17 miles below uh, Gemini 7, and some 88 miles in total range, somewhat behind Gemini 7 still, coming up under Gemini 7 until when these terminal maneuvers begin, he will go ahead and up on the same uh, level with Gemini 7. The radar lock-on has taken place. They're talking back and forth between each other, but we've had no confirmation that they have seen each other, although that would be anticipated almost any moment now. They will be out of range of ground stations very shortly, and whether we get word that they uh, actually have seen each other uh, uh, at the same moment that that uh, exciting uh, event takes place, we don't know as yet. It will depend at just what point that is. Of course, that isn't programmed precisely. Uh, the the field of vision, the depth uh, and distance of vision of man 185 miles above the Earth where these people are uh, hurtling along at 17,500 miles an hour has never been precisely established. However, the acquisition lights, these big, uh, powerful strobe lights on top of the Gemini 7 are on, winking at Gemini 6. The radar has locked on. They have communication. As we say, the astronauts are talking to each other. This American first already established of four astronauts in space at the same time in two separate vehicles. The Russians put three men up in a single vehicle. We now have the record for that as well. Let's take a look with our Colesman map and with our IBM computers and uh, graphic representations of just what has happened so far since that magnificent, absolutely perfect launch. It went off, as a matter of fact, just 71 one thousandths of a second off of the schedule at 8.37 this morning. Here is the representation of the Gemini 7 uh, uh, and Gemini 6 on Gemini 6's first revolution. The first maneuver uh, came as they came back around over the United States on the first trip. On this trip around, they were 1,200 miles apart, and Gemini uh, 6 was some 85 miles below uh, Gemini 7. But now, at this point, just south of New Orleans, the first maneuver took place. And Ed Byman, over at uh, the IBM computer, the Graphic Processing Center, can tell us, Ed, what happened in that uh, first correction. Uh, Walter, we have a uh, program brought into the machine which is on display on the tube you see in front of me. We show the two orbits of Gemini, 6 and 7. Gemini is shown at its perigee position, ready for thrusting to add some velocity and thereby increase its apogee. I'll simulate that by recognizing a symbol on the screen, which will show the thrusting appearing and a corresponding orbit being traced on the screen. As it happens, adding velocity at a perigee position does not cause them to go faster in the same direction, but rather causes them to travel in a somewhat larger path. And now we see the vehicles traveling in that path. Well, now at that point, they were just south of New Orleans, and Gemini 7 uh, was about 750 miles ahead, I believe it is, Ed, of uh, Gemini 6. And they go on around, as we see here, on their second, the second revolution for Gemini 6, the 116th revolution for Gemini 7. The next uh, maneuver, actually we don't show it here, but at that time G7 was turning around to face uh, G6 with its transponder, its radar. And then midway over the Indian Ocean on that second orbit, at this point that you see here now, uh, Shara was firing his aft rockets uh, for another maneuver. And Ed, what happened there? Well, here I've called in another program to show now Gemini 6 at its apogee position one half a revolution around the world later. Again, they add velocity in, to, uh, in their forward direction, increasing their speed, once more causing them to travel in a larger orbit. This time, however, they raise their perigee, as you can see here in the uh, diagram that's being traced. 
will select that orbit, and once more, they'll travel now in that path, somewhat larger path than they had before. This has the effect of increasing their uh, time around the world or slowing down their catch-up rate. At this point, Ed, they were about 510 miles, according to our calculation, behind Gemini 7. And away they kept worrying. Of course, they didn't stop as we are, but uh, they were on their way uh, around toward uh, their third revolution. There was another uh, performance, though, over uh, the uh, far western Pacific on that second orbit, and this was a very critical one. Ed Byman can tell us about that. Well, here we see still another program. This time we show a two-dimensional view of the orbital planes of Gemini 6 and 7. They were going to do a maneuver to change their plane, that is, align the plane, uh, orbital plane of Gemini 6 with that of 7. I've signaled the computer to reorient the picture on the screen to, in effect, take us in a different position in space. And you'll notice we've exaggerated the angles between the two planes. We've, we, in fact, show them at 45 degrees apart, when in actuality there were some seven one-hundredths of a degree apart or thereabouts. Now, if I back the vehicles up somewhat and let them uh, come in toward the intersection point of these two planes, you'll notice that Gemini 6 was reorienting itself to uh, get into a position 90 degrees to their direction of travel. In this uh, attitude, they can use their aft thrusters to change the direction of travel of Gemini 6 and get it into the same plane as Gemini 7. We show that by stopping Gemini 6 at the intersection point. There you see the thrusting appearing, and the plane is brought back into a co-planar position with 7. And then, of course, the vehicle that proceeds on its way and uh, is now in a co-planar uh, condition. Ed, uh, the, the amount of thrust it takes to do that is uh, clearly indicated uh, by the fact that that was such a small orbital change. Fortunately, Gemini 6 had been launched into just about the right orbit, but it still took 31 feet per second to that's just right. make that little tiny bit of change, and that's three times or four times as much as we ever did in Gemini 3, which is our first orbital plane change. All right, thank you, Ed. And now let's take a look at the Holzman map again as to where we proceeded from that point. That was Revolution 2 over the far western Pacific, just about over Indonesia. They came around now, and here they had to make a, another little change, as uh, Ed Byman over at our IBM Graphic Processing Center showed us uh, on that altitude uh, change. Well, that didn't quite do the job, and they came just a little bit short of what they needed in that altitude change, so they fixed it. Uh, with an extra maneuver added at this point to just about where they had the first altitude change. And this was a one foot per second burn. Very little change. In fact, it's so little, one foot per second, and the actual amount of thrust was given in less than, uh, uh, just barely a half a second. So they called it a tweaking burn, a tweaking maneuver. Just a tweak on the uh, jets to get it up just a little bit higher, not much. Now they went around for Revolution 3. And as they got near the uh, African uh, continent, they were preparing for a, another and a most critical maneuver again over the Indian Ocean. Ed Byman again at IBM. Ed? Well, here we've brought in a program to show this circularization maneuver. This is done with Gemini 6 at its apogee position. And once again, the astronauts would thrust to a velocity in their direction of travel. We see that once more on the screen, uh, simulating thrusting and a tracing on the screen an orbit corresponding to that thrusting. That is a circular orbit now, concentric with the orbit of Gemini 7. And now if we select that path and cause the vehicles to, to uh, move on our screen, we see that they will always be some 17 miles difference between the two orbits. Uh, after that, they're prepared to do the terminal maneuver. And can you, you show us, Ed, the terminal maneuver on there? Yes, we can. I, we take another liberty here, Walter, to uh, change the size of our circles on the screen, merely to demonstrate the terminal maneuver with more clarity. Let me make a point here, Ed, that that terminal maneuver is scheduled to begin about 15 minutes from now at about 1.55 right. Eastern Standard Time, and it goes on for oh, better than a half hour before they... Uh, uh, get uh, into their close uh, proximity of a thousand feet or so. Okay, Ed. All right. Uh, as the vehicles uh, approach this particular position, the astronauts would have reoriented Gemini 6 so that they had Gemini 7 in their line of sight. It may also have occurred that Gemini 7 had some other different attitude as well, but we don't show that on the screen now. They would then thrust in that direction to leave their circular orbit and travel an elliptical path that intersected 
the path of Gemini 7 some 130 degrees away. Now, if we select that path and cause the vehicles to move, you see that they start to travel at, toward the rendezvous point. Gemini 6, of course, is reoriented continuously through this entire maneuver to uh, keep Gemini 7 in line of sight. They do make some minor adjustments, I believe, uh, during this interval of time to make sure they're going to intersect at the right conditions. But when they reach that uh, intersection point of the two orbits, you will uh, see a thrusting appearing which takes Gemini 6 out of its elliptical path and puts it in a circular orbit, the same orbit that Gemini 7 is traveling. There you see that occurring now. From this point on, it would just be a matter of adjusting the orbit from time to time to close the distance between the two vehicles. Ed, can you take that back just a moment, just to that point where they begin to close, and we'll talk about uh, what, the, what the pilot Chirac is doing uh, with some of your IBM onboard equipment, uh, the uh, radar rendezvous equipment. Uh, as, as they move ahead there uh, on, this, uh, uh, on this path, and uh, I do suggest that uh, that seven should be facing six, Ed. Uh, I think it should. <laughs> however, that's a beautiful graphic representation you've got there. I congratulate you on progr that, programming that into your IBM machine. But at any rate, as it comes around there, uh, at that point, they're still 17 miles below, and they're about 38, 39 miles in their slant range right. from each other. At this point, uh, at this point, uh, we see that uh, uh, Shara sees in uh, his radar uh, the the range that he's away and what he's got to put into his machine uh, to finally close that last uh, 30 or 40 miles, which is uh, pretty tough to do. Uh, then, as they get actually close in there, it's eyeball. He flies it just like an airplane and comes on in. The, the uh, next uh, important maneuver, the beginning of the terminal maneuvers, closing, beginning now in about 12 minutes from now. CBS News color coverage of Gemini 6 and Gemini 7 will continue in a moment. Well, let's go immediately to an announcement from Paul Haney and Mission oh, Control. A new reading approximately every 100 seconds. Tom's last reading showed that the two were about 50 miles, 50 nautical miles apart, which is uh, coming right up on the desired value to begin their terminal phase initiation maneuver at an elapsed time of 5 hours, 18 minutes, 39 seconds. There may be a tolerance here of a minute or two from the values given earlier. The uh, indication it is possible the terminal phase may begin a, a little bit more than a minute late. However, all the values are coming up very close to expectation. This is Gemini Control Houston. You heard the announcement from Paul Haney. They're 57 and a half miles apart. Uh, that's just about where they're supposed to be, almost precisely where they're supposed to be at this moment, uh, with the terminal maneuver scheduled to begin about 10 minutes from now. At the time the terminal maneuver begins, according to the flight plan, the Gemini 6 will be 17 miles below Gemini 7, and that has been confirmed. They are indeed 17 miles below, and they should be 32 miles behind. That's uh, a 36.8 slant range. In other words, the actual mileage between the two, 36 and 8 tenths miles. At that point, Gemini 6 begins its terminal maneuvers. It turns on its radar and computers in order uh, that uh, these two ships can meet about halfway around the world from the time that that maneuver begins, or around 45 minutes later. The, uh, around 30, a little over 30 minutes later, actually. It's uh, a maneuver at that time of 33.7 uh, feet per second, pause grade along the line of sight, uh, as judged by the radar, to Gemini 7. Uh, we'll be standing by to hear that they have established visual contact as you can see from our Colesman map there, they are right now at the edge of the, that circle, which shows they're in touch with the Ascension Island Station. They'll be out of touch for a short while there, and then be in touch with Pretoria, South Africa, where we have a tracking station now uh, for the first time for this mission. And then uh, that uh, communication overlaps to Nanareev in the Malagasy Republic on that island, which was once called Madagascar, lying off the southeastern coast of Africa.
Africa. Uh, so we should be getting a pretty good word directly from the two spacecraft that they have sighted each other. This radar is now the critical feature of the flight, I suppose you'd say, wouldn't